So carrying on with our series of Burns lectures, we want to think about first aid. How do we manage burns that occur in the home situation, in the work situation, in any pre-hospital sort of uh, area? Now, if we think about thermal burns first, which is probably the most common we'll come across in the first aid situation. Thermal burns. These are burns, of course, caused by heat. So the first thing we need to do is to remove the heat source. Take away that which is generating the heat, it's fairly obvious. So this could include things like uh, extinguishing any flames. For example, if someone's clothes were on fire. And we would normally do this by smothering it. So ideally a fireproof cloth or any damp cloth would be good, ideally fireproof. And we would smother it because of course fire needs oxygen in order to, to burn. And if we take away the oxygen supply, the fire will go out. And a classic example of this is a chip pan fire where it will, um, if there's burning fat, the uh, disastrous thing to do, of course, would be to put water on it where the water would splash up all over the place and the fat would splash up, causing facial burns. Um, although this does sound ridiculous, we do actually sometimes see it in the A&E situation that someone's put water onto hot fat. The correct thing to do, of course, is to smother it with a, with a damp cloth. So that's fairly obvious, putting out the flames. Um, but... If someone has been exposed to a lot of heat, then the, the clothes that they're wearing will be very hot as well and will stay hot for some time. So uh, remove hot clothes. Because even if the flames are out, the clothes will remain hot for some minutes and will carry on burning. And we can remove them, and if we can't remove them, then we would want to douse them with cold water. And the only time we shouldn't remove clothes is if the clothes are sticking to the skin. Especially some uh, man-made material can melt and actually adhere to the skin. And if we were to remove them, we'd be pulling off and damaging the skin at the same time. In that case, we would just um, cool them off with, with cool water, wetting them with cool water. So we've got um, remove the heat source. And then we need to remove the heat from the tissues. Now the idea here is that once the tissues have become warm, once they are hot, once they've heated up to the point where they're damaging the tissues, then tissue is actually a fairly poor conductor of heat. So what will happen is the tissue will remain hot for a long period of time. And of course, as it remains hot, it's going to carry on conducting into undamaged areas and increase the size of the burn. And as it remains hot, it's going to increase the level of necrosis caused in the burnt area as the heat continues damaging the, uh, damaging the tissues. So having removed the heat source, we need to remove the heat from the tissues. And the way we do this is with cool water. Now the idea here is we don't want the water to be warm because we're trying to remove the heat, obviously, and the heat differential, the greater the heat differential, the greater the amount of conduction out of the tissues. But at the same time, we don't want the water to be cold because if the water's cold, that's going to cause a peripheral vasoconstriction. It's going to narrow the blood vessels, they're going to be a reflex. And that's going to reduce the amount of blood going to the area and the blood circulating through the area is actually another useful way that heat is removed from the tissues as blood plays its role in distributing heat equitably throughout the body. So cool water that's not causing vasoconstriction. Um, and it's surprising how many people don't realise that th this needs to be kept in cool water for 20 minutes to remove the heat. 
So the heat is not removed quickly, it, it, it takes time. As we've said, tissues are poor conductors. So we can either immerse it in cool water or we can shower the person with, with cool water, but we need to do it for 20 minutes. And the cool water also um, has a good analgesic effect. It, it's very soothing. And what happens in my experience here is that people have been in cool water for about 10 minutes the cool water's taken the pain out of the burn and they think, oh, that's it, I'm fine now. I'll just get out. But in actual fact, they need to stay in for another 10 minutes because it should be 20 minutes to remove the heat from the uh, tissues. And if you imagine you had a hot piece of beef, for example, and you just poured water over it for a minute, then you cut it open, it would still be warm inside. And that's essentially what human tissues are. And uh, as well as cool water, we can give pain relief. Once the cooling is, uh, once we've had the 20 minutes, do give pain relief. Give analgesics. And here we can use simple analgesics. So we can use um, paracetamol, that's acetaminophen in the US. We can give a gram of that to an adult, proportionally smaller doses to children, of course. We can give um, 400 milligrams of a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory such as uh, ibuprofen. And we could also give codeine, maybe 30 milligrams if that was available. And giving those together uh, provides a synergistic analgesic effect. Um, so it's good to remove the heat from it, but also people with burns, we have to remember, it depends on the environment, but people with burns are actually prone to hypothermia. And of course, water is very cooling systemically. So we want the cool water to cool the area locally but we want to avoid systemic cooling. So we want to avoid hypothermia. Because hypothermia is a complication of burns. So the patient needs to keep warm. So cool the burn, keep the patient warm. So we've removed the heat source we have removed the heat from the tissues. Now the next complication with burns, and it's a huge complication with burns, and it's a life-threatening complication with burns, is infection. So the next thing to do is to prevent infection. So we need to prevent contamination of the wound. We do not want this wound to be contaminated with bacteria. And the best thing to do here, once we've cooled the wound down, is, is cover with a clean, moist dressing. This is probably the best way if we need to transfer someone to hospital, just to cover it with a moist, a moist dressing. And the other thing that's good for burns is a uh, cling film. Just simple kitchen cling film. Or, or um, we could use a, a plastic sheet even. Clean one. Now, just simple cling film. This, this cling film here. You can just lay that over the burnt area and that will cover the burnt area. And it's actually keep keeping the bacteria out. So if there's a burnt area there, I'll keep the bacteria out. And it's also good because the burn will naturally release uh, inflammatory exudates, which are moist. So the cling film will keep the moisture in, promoting a, a moist wound healing environment. And because it's the body's own tissues, the, the inflammatory exudate should be sterile unless it's secondarily contaminated. But even relatively small burns are at great risk of infection. Infection is the great risk with burns. And uh, if we can prevent it in the first aid situation, that is a remarkably good thing to do. So there we have the basis of treating um, the first aid treatment of thermal burns. Fairly straightforward, but a few things to get right. 
Notice we're not using any fats on the burns, we're not putting butter on the burns, we're not using any of these traditional folk remedies. It's very simple, remove the heat source, remove the heat from the tissues, prevent infection. That is the role of the first aider in burns. And it's useful to think while we're doing this about uh, chemical burns. So we can think about chemical burns now as well. Now people often think about neutralising acids with alkalines and alkalines with acids and uh, there's no great evidence that this is effective. But what is effective if there is a dry powder, if someone's got a dry powder then brush it off. Normally the powders, the acid, acid and alkaline powders for example, are only going to be a particular problem when they get wet. So if someone spills a plaster or cement uh, on their skin, we can brush that off. And as long as uh, the skin keeps dry, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. But of course, there will be a residue left. And uh, for that, we have to uh, wash. So once it's brushed off with chemical burns, we'll then wash off. And we use large volumes of water. Just large volumes of water. Run it for a long time. But we do need to stress, we need to irrigate with large volumes. For example, very often in the uh, A&E situation, we get people with uh, cement or alkaline powders, sometimes acids, in, in their eyes, particular problem in the eyes. And of course in the eyes, if there's powder blown into the eyes, the eyes are moist anyway, so the alkaline is, is, is quickly activated. And indeed, we do keep um, pH indicators in the eye room to check for acids or alkalines in the eye. But we don't neutralise it. What we do is we wash it off with large volumes of 0.9%. Sodium chloride, normal saline, isotonic saline. So what we'll often do is put some local anaesthetic into the eye and then set up a normal intravenous giving set without the needle and uh, irrigate the eye for about 20 minutes. And again, patients get bored. They think it's done after five minutes, but often it's not. Then after 20 minutes of irrigation, we can check the eye again with a pH indicator to make sure we're getting down towards a normal physiological neutral pH, which is what we want. So again, nothing clever. We're not invoking chemistry. We're not neutralizing acids and alkalines. What we are doing is irrigating with large volumes of fluid. Now if we think about electrical burns, Now, obviously here we want to uh, remove the current. <laughs> so ideally disconnect the current at, at source. And you might remember that we said with a direct current, small voltages, relatively small voltages can be very dangerous. Uh, and with alternating current, also dangerous, but like a 100 volt shock AC and 100 volt DC, it's the 100 volt DC shock that is much more dangerous, the direct current, because the alternating current switching on and off usually, usually 50 times a, a second alternating current. But the problem with alternating current is it can cause tetany, and the person can end up gripping onto the thing which is electrocuting them. And when we're rescuing these patients, we have to be very careful not to electrocute ourselves. So if there's water around, that's going to increase the conductivity. But whether there's water or not, we don't want to touch these patients if they're being electrocuted. So we need to disconnect the source, ideally by switching it off, disconnecting the source, or pulling them away from the source, but making sure we insulate ourselves uh, from the patients. So if we're grabbing them, we could grab them through a large bundle of 
some insulating material, depending on the voltages, of course. If it's very high voltage, even that would not be adequate. So do think about your own safety there. Burns caused by uh, radiation. I mean, the key thing here really is, is mostly sunburn is the problem here. It's to try and prevent it. Um, once the burn is caused, of course, we want to prevent further burning. So remove from the, um, the radiation source. So any sunburned area should be protected from any further sun completely with, with full covering of clothes. And we can also have an analgesic effect by dampening the, uh, the burnt area down with, with a damp cloth. But unfortunately, once the damage has occurred and the inflammation often presents some time after the injury, um, there's nothing really we can do to reverse the damage that has already occurred, just stop any more from, from occurring. So a few simple guidelines there. Looked at thermal burns, chemical burns, electrical burns and uh, and radiation burns.